on the screen for you. But Jonathan and David had two polar opposite upbringings. You think Jonathan was the firstborn son of a king. David was the lastborn son of a farmer. But I'm going to tell you, when you have things that are different, but the one thing that you share in common is faith in the same God, in the same spirit is operating in you as is operating in that other person, you can form a bond that is kingdom that will never be broken. It is eternal. I have godly men in my life that I couldn't be more different before I gave my life to Christ. But now, because everything we live for is to see God's work in and around and through our lives, the same Spirit is molding us. If, if we are predestined to be conformed to the image of the same Christ, then we ought to start to look and act and talk a little bit more alike as we grow closer to the Lord. Simple as that. And then you start to look at the things that make us different and they become more and more minute. They're not important. They're not important. So you see, you know, this, this Jonathan and this David, chapter 18, verse 1 says, Now when he had finished speaking, to Saul, meaning David, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. But what we have to do is we have to take a step back and realize that this, this bond, this knitting of the soul didn't happen just like this in that moment. So you got to read the whole counsel of God's word in order to gain revelation. Or you won't understand what, why they hit it off so well. See, back in chapter 14, we are introduced to the zeal that Jonathan had. See, a lot of us th that have been in church a little while, we, if, if you're honest, you probably had the mentality that Jonathan and David were pretty close in age. Well, theologians believe that they had to have been substantially uh, an age gap because Jonathan was in the battlefield much longer than David was. So Jonathan was older than David. But how many of us know that it is essential and it is important for us to get around people that are older than us, that are willing to pour into us, that see the good in us, that are willing to help, that they're going to be the hands and feet, tools in the hands of God to help sharpen and bring about the, the, the purpose of God for our life. We've got to have some spiritual big brothers and big sisters that is biblical. Women, you've got to find you some young women, right? And the good thing is, one of the characteristics that you'll see in both Jonathan and David that made them qualified to be a godly friend was humility. Humility, because if Jonathan was not humble, then it would have been real quick and easy for him to look at David and say, who is this? Who is this kid that's coming and getting all this attention and, and now all of a sudden he's going to take the throne? You see, in the world and in the flesh, we have this expectation. We live in a consumer industry and it's invaded the church and it's invaded the, the, the Christianity that we all live in. There is a consumer mentality to Christianity and even amongst friendships. We have this consumer way of looking at our friends. So when I asked you earlier, why do you have the friends you have? Often, if we're honest, is man, it's how they benefit you in your life. You can talk more about the fact that what? They're funny. They're there for you when you need them. Often, the, the list will be more of what they do for you than the fact that God put them in your life, and you're going to pour into them whether or not they pour back into you or not. And see, that is where Jonathan couldn't care less. We see in, in chapter 14, in, in, you know, there was this battle going on, and Saul, his father, had lost the anointing of God on his life. And so Saul, his father, is not leading with the anointing anymore. And Jonathan can see that his father lost the anointing. So what does he do? 
He doesn't tell his father, but he takes it upon himself to grab his arm bearer. And he says, let's go. Verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So what is, they, what is Jonathan saying? Jonathan is saying, look, I know it's just me and you, but I know that God is able. And if God is going to go ahead and he's leading me to go this way, then I believe that God is able to conquer this battle for me. So what does that mean about Jonathan's faith? He knew that apart from God, he wasn't capable of much. But with God's obedience in his life and with the faith that he had in God the Father, he was able to conquer anything because he believed that God is able. So he had a zeal for God the Father. Same zeal that you see in Jonathan, you see in chapter 17 when we look at the story of David and Goliath, which we've, we've looked at. Many of you know that story. But the part that Jonathan, see, we don't realize that there was some time that went by from chapter 14 to chapter 17. There were some battles fought, battles won. Time went by. And, and now you have to think about well, Jonathan was standing around when Goliath was standing out there taunting the, the soldiers of Israel. Where was the Jonathan from chapter 14 in chapter 17? How many of you know that no matter how much faith you might have on any given day, there's coming a day where you will feel defeated? This is the importance of godly friendships in your life. Because you will not be on the mountain every day. And you will not be feeling like, like, man, God is able and God is good and I just believe all these things every single day. We go through faith droughts where we just dry up and we wonder, Lord, what, what in the world, what's going on? And the enemy beats us up in the head and we start to feel like, man, I, I feel like I can't win for losing. And all of a sudden, look how God operates. He sends this young David with a zeal. And David goes out there on the field and David says, you know what? I, I know I don't have the equipment and I might be a youth and, and Saul tried to talk him out of it. But he had this faith. He said, look, I believe that God would deliver the Philistines into our hands today. And what was his motive? He says, so that all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. You see, when you have a motive that all the earth would know Christ, God will anoint you to do some things. And when you've got somebody like that in your life who's around you, it spreads like wildfire. And what happened to Jonathan was he looked at that young man and he said, man, I remember when I had that faith. I've been sitting here all these days and this man's been taunting me and I'm sitting here just like, man, I'm, I'm full of fear right now. But then he saw this zeal. And he was reminded, God is able. And they are uncircumcised. They are the enemy of God. And all of a sudden, the faith of, of God came off of David and jumped on Jonathan. And they shared that same zeal. And he realized, God, you sent me someone to rekindle the flame. Do you have anybody in your life that when you feel like you're about to go out, like your wood got wet, that can spark that fire back in you and say God is still on the throne and he is able. Do you have somebody? Are you that somebody? Can you? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you, if you look at your circle and, you, and you're thinking about who are your friends, when I say do you have godly friends, they have to fit this description. Are they concerned and capable of being yielded to Christ to be used of God to help you fulfill the purpose on your life. Are they helping you grow closer to Christ? They have to be concerned about that. You know what people do in the flesh? They surround themselves with people who live about like they live or less than. Because if you get around people that are holy, you realize you're not that holy. And it bothers you. So some people don't like to hang out with people that are real serious about God. Because they're not ready to get too serious about God. We'll share a seat next to them on Sunday. But they're not coming to eat at your house 
any old day of the week because they might see how you really act. See, we got to be around some people that we can be vulnerable with, that we can, we can take the mask off, and, and they're not going to judge us. Because a real kingdom friend don't judge you. They encourage you and they motivate you. They love you through your mess. Because they can't help but realize that, you know what? Chapter 14, I was scared. But we're going to see in just a little bit that that same Jonathan from chapter 14 is coming up to chapter 19. And then he's coming up to chapter 20 and chapter 23. And you know what he's going to do then? He's going to encourage David's hand in the Lord. Because that is the way this life works. It's a seesaw. Right? Sometimes I slip and I got to grab you. And sometimes you'll slip and you'll grab me. But together, we both got somebody to grab. We got to have these people in, in our lives. And so this morning, if you don't have these people in your life, the, the, the most important question to ask next, next is, am I that person for people? Am I that person or, or, or do I just sit back and very passively let others? I don't want to judge, right? Because we have that mentality. I don't want to judge. You know what? One theme has been coming up repeatedly in my life lately. And it's two words the Lord spoke to me. And he said, love warns. Love warns. I want us to look at chapter 17 and, and, and realize that, you know, Saul comes and, and they hear of this David and, and how he wins this battle and he, he, he defeats this Goliath. And Jonathan's close enough by for this conversation because Saul asked him at the end of chapter 17, whose son are you? And I believe that Saul knew whose son he was. But sometimes the enemy has a way of trying to keep us feeling bad about who we are. Trying to keep reminding us that we ain't, we, we ain't never going to be nobody. And you know, I, I love that song by Casting Crowns. Is it Casting Crowns? I'm just a nobody. Who sings that? Casting crowns. I'm just a nobody. Because that's that ought to be our response every time the enemy comes and starts telling us that we ain't nobody. Because you know what the truth is? We're not. But he still redeemed us. You want to tell me I'm not worthy? Praise God. I'm not. But he still saved me. You want to go ahead and tell me that I, that I wasn't never supposed to be a nobody? You're absolutely right. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. You can keep coming at me. You can tell me all about what kind of a worthless you know, person that I was and all these different things. But at the end of the day, I serve a God who takes the nobody and he gives them a new name. And it's child of God. It's daughter. It's son. It's redeemed. It's loved. It's chosen. 